So in the previous classes, we had uh, discussed about the uh, bio macromolecules, isn't it? So we had discussed about the <clears throat> proteins and other things. So nucleic acid is also one of the bio macromolecules. So in the earlier, uh, previous to that, we might have studied about uh, the nitrogenous bases. Then we discussed about nucleoside and nucleotide. So you are aware about that, isn't it? So in the uh, present class, what you would be having is uh, the discussion about nucleic acids. So nucleic acids are heteropolymer of nucleotides. Why we use the term hetero is they are not similar. They are different. So uh, here you can notice that the nitrogenous bases will be varying, isn't it? So the nucleotide can be adenylic acid or guanylic acid, or it can be uh, thymidylic acid. That is the reason we have the name as heteropolymer, since they are not well, one type of monomers that are making this nucleotide. So nucleic acids are heteropolymer of nucleotides. That is many nucleotides are linked to form polynucleotide. So it is a polynucleotide, but the nucleotides are hetimo, heteropolymer. So that we have to remember about. Some of the nucleotide might be adenylic acid, guanylic acid, cytidylic acid, or thymidylic acid. So it varies. So that is why we use the term heteropolymer of nucleotides. So it is many nucleotides are linked to form polynucleotides. You know, already know that nucleic acids are of uh, two different types, that is DNA and RNA, deoxyribonucleic acid and ribose nucleic acid. So nucleic acids are of two types, deoxyribonucleic acid and ribose nucleic acid. So you have to remember the two types of nucleic acids. So you might have, uh, so you should also remember about the Watson and Crick uh, model of DNA so double helical model of DNA or duplex model of DNA, we also call it as. So this is a open chain compound. See, uh, the DNA is helically wound compound, but the open chain parent compound, this is how it is. So one strand will be from five prime to three prime. Another strand will be from three prime to five prime. So they are anti-parallel to each other. So guanosine, uh, guanylic acid always base space with guanosine, guanine base space with cytosine, adenine base space with thymine. So this is how the uh, base pairing are there. <clears throat> so the uh, in between adenine and thymine, the bond will be triple bond. In between guanine and cited, uh, cytosine, the bond will be uh, the uh, bond will be triple bond. Okay, so double bond and triple bonds you can notice in case of this, uh, the bonds between the adenine and uh, thymine and guanine and cytosine. So just remember about it. So there are more than a dozen forms of DNA, such as it can be A type of DNA, B type of DNA, C type of DNA, D types of DNA, E, Z, etc. So there are dozen forms of DNA, such as A, B, C, D, E, Z, etc. So DNA consists of two polynucleotide strands. So one is in the five prime to three prime, another polynucleotide strand is in from three prime to five, five prime. So the DNA consists of two polynucleotide, <coughs> two polynucleotide strands arranged anti-parallelly as a double helix. So you can notice here five prime to three prime and another is anti-parallel to it, three prime to five prime. So the DNA consists of two polynucleotide strands, that is five prime to three prime and three prime to five prime, arranged anti-parallelly as a double helical structure. So it is arranged anti-parallelly as a double helical structure. Okay, so the internucleotide distance is uh, 3.4 angstrom. So then uh, uh, the diameter of it is 20 angstrom. So the 0.34, 
nanometer you can also say it as the internucleotide distance is 0.34 nanometer for every uh, 10 nucleotides there is a repeat of base sequences so that is for every 3.4 nanometer there is a repeat of base sequences and uh, the diameter of it is 2 nanometer or if you are uh, saying it in angstrom it would be 20 see nanometer is 2 into 10 to the power of minus 9 nanometer is 10 to the power of minus 9 angstrom is 10 to the power of minus 10 so you should remember about that so they can either be giving it in nanometer or angstrom so if it is angstrom it is 2 nanometer if uh, sorry 20 nanometer if it is angstrom and if it is uh, the nanometer 2 nanometer so 20 angstrom is the diameter or 2 nanometer so 3.4 angstrom is the internucleotide distance if you are saying it in nanometer it is 0.34 nanometer and for every uh, 10 base sequences there is a repeat of uh, base sequences for every 10 nucleotides there is a repeat of base sequences so that 10 is nothing but uh, 3.4 nanometer or in terms of angstrom it is for every 34 angstrom there is a repeat of base sequences so this is what you have to remember regarding the uh, structure of dna and again we'll be discussing the structure of dna in much more detail in the second year when we are uh, uh, going to study about the molecular basis of inheritance uh, so the duplex model of dna will be again discussing about as of this year you just remember there are nearly 12 uh, dozen forms of dna such as a b c d e z etc so the dna consists of two polynucleotide strands which are arranged anti parallelly as a double helical structure so this is a open chain compound so here you have the rungs of ladder like so they are the uh, base space see uh, adenine always base space with thymine guanine always base space with cytosine so that is what you have to remember about so in the next in dna a nucleotide consists of nitrogen base deoxyribose sugar and phosphate group so dna is also a, a polymer of uh, nucleotides so it is a heteropolymer of nucleotides rather so they they consist of nitrogen base deoxyribose sugar phosphate groups so in dna nucleotide consists of nitrogen base deoxyribose sugar and phosphate group okay so this uh, the uh, strands of the ribbon like structures are nothing but the sugar phosphate back bone and the rungs of the ladder are the nitrogenous base pairs which are uh, which are having complementary base pairing so as per the complementary base pairing adenine always base with base pairs with thymine and vice versa that is thymine always base pairs with adenine similarly guanine always base pairs with <coughs> cytosine or uh, cytosine base pairs with guanine so there is a complementary base pairing that you can uh, that you can see in these structures okay so the backbone strands of dna it is formed by sugar phosphate sugar phosphate uh, sugar phosphate sugar chain so you can see here sps sps so the sugar phosphate sugar chain that is what is the backbone of dna or the strands of dna form so the steps or rungs of the ladder as it looks they are formed of nitrogen base space nitrogen bases include since it is <clears throat> dna it has adenine guanine thymine and cytosin so uracil is present uh, only in rna it is absent in dna okay that is a uh, one of the uh, significant feature to differentiate between dna and rna the sugar would be ribose sugar in case of dna it is deoxyribose sugar so the nitrogenous basis base will be the similar to rna that is adenine guanine and cytosine are similar so dna has thymine thymine is absent in rna so rna has uracil uracil is absent in dna 
So that is one nitrogen base which is present. Uracil is present only in RNA and it is absent in DNA. So that you have to remember about. So the nitrogen basis of DNA includes adenine, guanine. Adenine is denoted by capital A. Guanine is denoted by G. Thymine is denoted by T. And cytosine is denoted by C. Uracil, which is denoted by U, is absent. Uracil is present only in case of RNA. And thymine is absent in uh, RNA. So that is what you have to uh, remember about. So uracil is present only in RNA and thymine is absent in RNA. So that is the distinguishing feature between DNA and RNA. So adenine pairs with thymine. So the bond is double bond. Adenine always base pairs with thymine and vice versa. So they have two hydrogen bonds. Guanine base pairs with cytosine and the bond is triple bond. So guanine always base pairs with cytosine and they have this triple bond. So three hydrogen bonds are there. So these bonds are made up of hydrogen bonds. Okay. So adenine always base pairs with thymine and vice versa. Thymine always base space with adenine and the bond is going to be two hydrogen bonds and guanine always base space with cytosine and vice versa. That is cytosine always base space with guanine and the bond will be triple bond that is they are held by three hydrogen bonds. So this is also another important feature you have to remember. Adenine pairs with thymine and they'll be having two hydrogen bonds. Guanine pairs space with cytosine and vice versa and they'll be having three hydrogen bonds. So a phosphate molecule links the three prime carbon of the uh, sugar of one nucleotide to the five prime carbon of the uh, next of the sugar of the next nucleoside nucleotide. So a phosphate molecule links the three prime carbon of sugar of one nucleotide to the five prime carbon of the sugar of the next nucleotide. So that is how the uh, phosphate molecule links. So the three prime carbon of the sugar of one nucleotide is linked to the five prime carbon of the uh, next nucleotide. So that is how uh, the phosphate uh, molecule backbone is made up of. So at one end, the phosphate is attached to five prime and to the other nucleotide, nitrogenous base of the nucleotide, they are attached at the three prime end. So that is how uh, the, to the other sugar of the next nucleotide, they are attached at the three prime end. So this five prime and three prime, they are going to alternate. So a phosphate molecule links the three prime carbon of the sugar of one nucleotide to the five prime carbon of the sugar of the next nucleotide. So that is how here it is attached at three prime, here it is attached at five prime. Again, it is attached at three prime, three prime of the sugar and five prime of the sugar. So the phosphate is attached to three prime and five prime of the sugar. That is how they are attached to the uh, the phosphate molecule links the three prime carbon of the sugar of one nucleotide to the five prime carbon of the sugar of the next nucleotide. So that is what you have to uh, remember about. The other properties of uh, the DNA are, so the bond between phosphate and OH group of sugar is an ester bond. So as there is one such, such ester bond on either side of uh, it, it is called as phosphodiester bond. See the bond between phosphate and OH group of sugar is an ester bond. See the bond between the phosphate and uh, sugar and OH group of sugar is an ester bond. So this bond is ester bond. Here it is hydrogen bond, here it is ester bond. And since they have two ester bonds, so on either side, it is called as phosphodiester bond. So the bond between the phosphate and OH group of sugar is an ester bond. And since they have uh, this bond on either side, of this phosphate, sugar phosphate backbone, 
it is called as phosphodiester bond. The bond between sugar and nitrogen base is called N-glycosidic bond. See, the phosphodiester bond is the bond between phosphate and 3 prime OH. Okay, phosphate and OH of the sugar. So that is called as uh, ester bond. And since they have two strands, we call it as phosphodiester bond. The bond between sugar and nitrogenous base. So it is going to be N-glycosidic bond. So ester bond, N-glycosidic bond, hydrogen bonds. So you can notice that. So the bond between sugar and the nitrogen base is called N-glycosidic bond. <clears throat> so now in beta DNA, what you can notice or B DNA, what you can notice is one full turn has 10 steps. That is 10 base space. Length of one full turn equals 34 angstrom. That is 3.4 angstrom for each step. So here in the diagram, it has been given as 3.4 nanometer. So in nanometer, it is 3.4. But if you write it in angstrom, it is going to be 34 angstrom. I told you one angstrom, a to the power of zero. So that is angstrom, a degree. However, you remember it as one angstrom equals 10 to the power of minus 10 meter. One angstrom equals 10 to the power of minus 10 meter. So length of one full turn, one full turn has 10 steps or 10 base pairs. Okay, so one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. So that is how they'll be having 10 base pairs. So one full turn has... Uh, 10 base space or it has 10 steps. So one full turn has 10 steps or 10 base space. So length of one full turn equals 34 angstrom. Okay. And it can also be uh, that is 3.4 angstrom for each step that is the internucleotide distance is 3.4 angstrom or in terms of nanometer it is 0.34 nanometer and this one full turn has 10 steps that is uh, 3.4 nanometer so in terms of nanometer 34 angstrom will be 3.4 nanometer and internucleotide distance will be 0.34 nanometer but if you are writing in angstrom it is internucleotide distance is 3.4 angstrom at each step the strand turns 36 degree for a full turn so 360 degree is for a full turn so at each step the strand turns 36 degree so 360 degree is for complete turn so that is what you have to remember regarding the structure of uh, b dna so the next that we are going to discuss about is the topic is metabolism so you know that metabolism is one of the living attributes of all the organism. So the sum total of all the chemical reactions which takes place within an organism, we call it as metabolism. So we have already about studied about types of metabolism. So if it is a building up process, we call it as anabolism. Example is the photosynthesis. If it is a breakdown process, we call it as catabolism. Example is the uh, respiration, the molecular uh, cellular oxidation that is taking place. Okay, so metabolism is either building up process, which we call it as anabolism, or it is a breakdown process, which we call it as catabolism. In building up process, simple molecules are going to form complex molecule. In breakdown process, complex molecules are going to break down to form simple molecules. So that is the catabolism. So metabolism is of two types, anabolism and catabolism. So let us study about this in detail, the metabolism. See, all the biochemical reactions taking place inside a living system, together it constitutes metabolism. So all the biochemical reactions taking place inside a living system. So together they constitute 
metabolism or you can also say it as the sum total of all the uh, chemical reactions taking place within our body we can call it as metabolism see there is uh, in the human body they have just given an example in this slide you can see what are all the uh, metabolism that is taking place digestion is taking place so there is breakdown of carbohydrates breakdown of fats breakdown of proteins so the food that we have ingested they are broken down into the simplest molecule which is absorbed by the intestine and the blood carries the food in the form of uh, glucose in the form of amino acids in the form of fatty acids so they are in the simplest form so which can be absorbed and uh, carried by the blood to each and every part of the cell they are supplying this nutrient so this digestion is also a metabolic process so the removal of uh, the uh, what do you call it as the carbon dioxide through respiration exhalation so the removal of it then body heat so loss of body heat so that is also one Uh, byproduct of these metabolic reactions so there are a lot of metabolic reactions that are taking place within an organism especially human uh, example here they have given where digestion respiration excretion within the liver there is a formation of urea so by this uh, ornithin cycle so all those are examples of metabolism various Uh, biochemical reactions taking place within a living system all the biochemical reactions taking place inside a living system together constitute metabolism example removal of carbon dioxide from amino acids to form amine removal of amino group in a nucleotide base hydrolysis of a glycosidic bond so all these are metabolic process so removal of carbon dioxide from amino acids to form amine removal of amino group in a nucleotide base then hydrolysis of a glycosidic bond so metabolic process for digestion they have taken uh, given it here food intake food breakdown takes place and this food breakdown is carried to each and every cell where they undergo respiration energy is created and body is repaired using this energy and this activity energy is again utilized for intake of food so this is how the metabolic process is taking place within an organism so here you can notice this uh, catabolism and anabolism process taking place here uh, so the nutrients carbon substrates so minerals uh, nitrogen substrates the growth factors so they have given a slide where there is both catabolism and anabolism process taking place so these are all various examples of the metabolism that is removal of carbon dioxide from amino acids to form amine so the removal of amino group in a nucleotide base and hydrolysis of glycosidic bond they are all the metabolic reactions examples a few uh, examples for metabolic reactions okay so you need not have to mug up all the cycles these are only explanatory in nature so you should remember about this part of it they are just explanatory in nature and you need not have to mug it up so they are just to make you understand the concept okay so nothing else apart from that so the intermediate products of the, the metabolic reactions we are calling it as metabolites so what are metabolites <clears throat> the intermediate products that we are going to obtain during metabolic reactions we are calling it as metabolites so this metabolites might be primary metabolites or secondary metabolites so the intermediate products obtained during metabolism we call it as metabolites the metabolites might be of two types primary metabolites and secondary metabolites so the flow of metabolites in a metabolic pathway has a definite uh, rate and direction similar to automobile traffic so this uh, metabolite flow is called dynamic state of body constituents so the flow of metabolites in metabolic pathway it has a definite rate and direction similar to the uh, traffic that we notice okay this metabolite process is called dynamic state of uh, body constituents so there is a uh, 
definite rate and direction of flow of metabolites, which we call it as dynamic state of body constituents. So it is dynamic. So it's a constantly changing thing. Uh, of body constituents, the flow of metabolites has a definite rate and direction. So it has a pathway. That is the reason we call it as dynamic state of body constituents. So the metabolites are of two types, the primary metabolites and secondary metabolites. So what do you mean by primary metabolites? They have identifiable functions in physiological processes and they are necessary for life and they are formed initially. The first form they are, as the name indicates, primary metabolites. They have identifiable functions in physiological processes and they are necessary for life. Example, what are the primary metabolites? Amino acids, sugars, nucleic acids, lipids, vitamins. They are all the primary metabolites. So they have identifiable functions in physiological process and they are necessary for life. So we call those which are necessary for life and they have identifiable function in physiological process and necessary for life. We call them as primary metabolites. Example is amino acid, sugar, nucleic acid, lipids, vitamins, etc. So the secondary metabolites, they are not directly involved in normal growth, development or reproduction. So these metabolites, uh, the products, the intermediate products obtained during uh, the metabolic uh, reactions, uh, these secondary metabolites, they are not directly involved in normal growth reproduction or development so they are found in plants so the secondary metabolites are found in plants fungi and microbial cells so what are the secondary metabolite examples for it alkaloids the pigments terpenoids essential oils toxins lectins glycoproteins we call it as lectins uh, drugs they are all example of this secondary metabolite so they are not directly involved in normal growth development or reproduction but they are found in uh, so the secondary metabolites they are not involved directly involved in the normal growth development or reproduction so they are found in plant fungi and microbial cells examples of the secondary metabolites are alkaloids pigments terpenoids essential oils toxins lectins drugs so these are all called as the secondary metabolites. So metabolites are of two types. The primary metabolites, they have identifiable functions in physiological process and they are necessary for life. Example for this uh, primary metabolites are amino acids, so the sugars, nucleic acids, lipids, vitamins. So they are directly involved in normal growth, development and reproduction. So these primary metabolites and they have identifiable function in physiological process and they are necessary for life. So these type of intermediate products obtained during metabolism, which are uh, required for life, we call them as primary metabolites. Secondary metabolites are the intermediate products which are obtained in case of fungi, plant cell and microorganisms, which do not have a direct role in growth development or reproduction. So we call them as secondary metabolites. Examples are alkaloids, pigments, terpenoids. Then we have the essential oils, toxins, lectins, drugs. They are all the example for secondary metabolites. So you should be remembering about uh, the definition of primary and secondary metabolite and the examples. So for two marks, they might be asking you the question regarding it. So now they have given you some examples of this secondary metabol metabolites. Uh, <clears throat> the pigments examples are carotenoids. They are precursors of vitamin A, we call it as. So carotenoids or oranges in color, they are precursors of vitamin A. So you find them in a lot of fruits like carrots, papaya. So you can notice them, these carotenoids are found in uh, almost all types of oranges colored fruits. So they are uh, the pigments that are present. And as I've already told you, carotenoids are uh, precursors for vitamin E, vital amino acid, vitamins are. Uh, 
so they are precursors of vitamin a carotenoids so the anthocyanins are responsible for color of the flower and fruits so these are the pigments which are responsible for the color of the flower and fruits so the carotenoids anthocyanins are pigments okay the alkaloids so they are like morphine codine see morphine and codine they are obtained from opium opium is gasgase plant or this poppy seeds what we call it as so this is papaver somnifera the poppy plant or papaver somnifera so the unripe buds what they do is they generally make a cut and collect this milky latex so this milky latex dried milky latex is a source of opiates uh, that is heroin morphine and uh, opium are obtained from this uh, this milky latex so they are uh, the unripe fruits are cut and the milky latex are collected and they are used for the extraction of this opiates that is opm heroin and morphine so which are used as, as narcotic drugs so you should be aware about that so that is the reason the growth of poppy plants this papaver somnifera they require license so even though the flowers are very ornamental and if you are found growing them and your neighbor places a complaint so there would be a severe action taken as per narcotic acts so they would be taking a severe action on the person who is growing this plant so even farmers who are growing poppy plants the gasgase the poppy seeds so they should have uh, the permission from the they should have a license obtained from the uh, government so you cannot grow just like that uh, a opiate plant or this papaver somnifera okay so the uh, alkaloids the morphine codeine uh, which are obtained from the uh, opm so they are extracted from so they are also the secondary metabolites so the morphine and codeine so even they are utilized in uh, medicine medical purposes so at lower dosage okay but abuse of this substance is taking place a lot especially the opiates which i am talking about then some of the examples of the secondary metabolites like terpenoids monoterpenes diterpenes essential oils were obtained from the citronella grass that is lemon grass oil so it is called as citronella so the essential oil like lemon grass oil or eucalyptus oil the nilgiri taila what we call it as so the eucalyptus oil they are all also example for secondary metabolites the toxins abrin so it is uh, obtained from plants okay ricin ricin is obtained from this uh, castor plant you know the castor oil isn't it we have a proverb itself harlenne kudangire ma that is what we say when someone's face is having a, a very dumb reaction we use that okay so this castor oil which is obtained from this castor plant ricinus communis from which they extract this ricin ricin is used as a, a biological uh, warfare uh, they are utilizing this toxic substance ricin okay that is extracted from this uh, ricinus communis that is the uh, castor plant okay so they are toxic substances abrin ricin lectins so like concan concana valin a lectin then drugs are obtained like from vinca rosea we obtain this vin blastin curcumin is obtained from so curcuma longa that is turmeric so turmeric plant we obtain curcumin so vin blastin we are obtaining it from this periwinkle plant so vinca rosea vin blastin which is used for treatment of cancer vin blastin curcumin so they are also obtained from the turmeric plant so these are all the uh, drugs which are used in for medicinal purposes so the polymeric substances which we are obtaining the rubber gums cellulose next time you are utilizing them remember that they are all products of secondary metabolites okay from the plants fungi or microbes so the polymeric substances from rubber plant hevea brasiliensis we have obtained the rubber Uh, then from the plants the cell wall has the cellulose isn't it the gums that are obtained from uh, plants resins so they are all 
the secondary metabolites so they are the polymeric substances so you have to remember some of the secondary metabolites and the examples associated with them so you can here further see for the uh, essential oils you have this uh, eucalyptus leaves nilgiri taila what i told you about eucalyptus oil so even from the cinnamon so you can obtain the chakke or cinnamon you can also obtain the essential oil clove oil very expensive even this from the lavanga they extract this clove oil so they are all some of the essential oils you can obtain uh, apart from lemon grass oil lemon grass plant in especially in thailand and uh, vietnam they use this lemon grass extensively in their food okay so the lemon grass oil so the essential oil which can be extracted from that so ginger also they can extract this uh, essential oil for aroma yellow flowers scented flowers from which they can obtain terpenoids so these plants uh the you can obtain terpenoids so you can obtain the essential oils okay see here they have categorized these uh, essential oils one is for the aroma purpose that is eucalyptus oil then ginger they are utilized for the aroma purpose flavor purpose we are using the cinnamon and clove okay and yellow uh, flowers they also have the scent from which we can extract this perfumes okay so the they contain terpenoids and lemon grass oil then abrin is obtained from rosary pea so they are the most toxic uh seeds i was talking about so the toxins abrin is obtained from rosary pre so probably abras it might start with the plant name resin is obtained from this resinous communis or castor plant you might have seen this castor plant and the castor seeds so the, why they cause indigestion is they have a very low percentage of uh, toxic substance resin in these castor seeds okay but they are highly purified and concentrated to form this resin which is toxic substance concanvalin a is obtained from canavelia nc formus so it is also called as jack bean so the concanvalin a which is obtained from this jack bean so they are a lectin so this is the vin blastin and vin cristin which is obtained from this periwinkle plant you might have seen this uh so they have this uh rosette arrangement of corolla rotary corolla we call it as wheel shaped corolla so this is an example of a plant periwinkle plant from which the medicinal uh, drugs like vinblastin and vincristin which are used for uh, treatment of cancer it is obtained from this uh, plant periwinkle plant so the curcumin or the uh curcuma longa that is it is obtained from the turmeric plant so today the golden milk is a very popular concept in america they have realized the importance of uh, the turmeric uh, powder and they utilize this and add this turmeric powder to milk and consume it as a health drink the golden milk so the curcumin is obtained from turmeric so our uh, siddha system of medicine ayurveda and uh, even the unani system they say a lot about the medicinal property of turmeric uh, as a medicinal plant okay so curcumin is obtained from turmeric plant so the rubber and gums that we get from plants they are the polymeric substances which are nothing but secondary metabolites so those of you Uh, who have this rubber plantation remember so your source of income is from this secondary metabolite okay they are the polymeric substances that you are obtaining from these plants so the metabolic pathways what are those these are series of interlinked multi step chemical reactions in metabolism so they are series of interlink they are not in isolation each and everything has 
some role. So you can notice here somewhere there is a, uh, a respiration process. So for that, they require different substrates. Where are they obtained from? From earlier substrates. So the digestion process, we are getting back the certain uh, essential amino acids. Okay, from the diet, we are obtaining some amino acids. So we are obtaining the fatty acids and uh, glycerol from the uh, food diet that we intake, the intake of food, vitamins, we are getting it. Okay, each and everything is interlinked. Okay, so in the liver, if uh, there is a formation of uh, the toxic nitrogenous waste are brought to the liver through the blood. In the liver, they undergo the ornithin cycle. So, and this toxic nitrogenous waste are converted into non-toxic urea, which is removed through the urination process. Okay, so a lot of such steps are involved. So, these are metabolic pathways are the series of linked multi-step chemical reactions in metabolism. For our convenience, what we are doing it is we are studying about nucleic acids separately. We are studying about amino acids separately, carbohydrates separately. We are compartmentalizing it, but in uh, within our system, they are all uh, metabolic pathways, interlinked, series of interlinked multi-step chemical reactions are there uh, within an organism. So we call that as metabolic pathway. So metabolic pathways are the series of linked multi-step chemical reactions in metabolism. So which we are studying it separately, we are isolating it and studying it, but they are all interlinked. Digestion process is interlinked. The respiration process is interlinked. So various metabolic pathways. So the series of linked multi-step chemical reactions uh, in metabolism, we call it as metabolic pathways. So there are uh, types of metabolic pathways are anabolic, biosynthetic and catabolic pathways. In anabolic pathways, what do you notice? So the simpler molecules are going to form complex structures. So this is a constructive process. Simpler molecules are going to form complex structures and we call it as a constructive process. So complex molecules are becoming simple structures, which is a destructive process, a breakdown process. In the process, energy is released. In anabolic pathway, it consumes energy. In catabolic pathway, it releases energy. So you can uh, notice here, the simple molecules are going to combine to form a complex structure. So it is a constructive process. This is anabolism, like photosynthesis is an example. Okay, catabolism is a complex structure breaks down to form simple structures. It is a breakdown process. In the anabolism, energy is, it consumes energy. In catabolism, energy is liberated. It releases energy. So the anabolic pathway, the examples are acetic acid. They are going to form cholesterol. So a simple molecules are going to form the cholesterol complex molecule that is cholesterol. Amino acid simple uh, monomers are going to form this proteins, photosynthesis. So these are the examples for anabolic pathway. In catabolic pathway, glucose, breaking down of glucose to lactic acid, glycolysis. So uh, that is a breakdown process. Respiration is an example for that. So the uh, lacto lactic acid fermentation itself is an example for catabolic pathway. Alcoholic fermentation can also be taken as an example for catabolic pathway. The glycolysis step that is taking place, one of the steps of respiration. So that is also a uh, catabolic pathway. Respiration itself is an example for catabolic pathway. So glucose forming lactic acid, the formation of curd. So it is a catabolic pathway. So there is a breakdown of complex molecule to form simple structures and in the process energy is released. So this is the difference between anabolic pathway and catabolic pathway. So two types of metabolic pathways are there. Anabolic, which is biosynthetic or constructive process and catabolic, which is the breakdown or destructive process. In anabolic pathway, energy is consumed. In catabolic pathway, energy is released. So the energy which is released through the catabolism is stored 
in the form of chemical bonds. When needed, this bond energy is utilized for biosynthetic process, osmotic process, and mechanical work. So the energy released through catabolism, it is stored in the form of chemical bonds. That is adenosine triphosphate. So ATP, it is stored as the energy or the universal currency of energy universal energy currency in all the organism, whether it is amoeba or in a complex organism like human being, the energy can be recognized only in the form of adenosine triphosphate, ATP. So the energy is released through the catabolism. It is stored in the form of chemical bonds. The most important energy currency in living system is the bond energy in adenosine triphosphate. So there is a lot of energy in the bonds. So the adenosine triphosphate molecule, when they break down, so there is a release of this energy. So formation of ATP, it requires large amount of energy. When there is a breakdown of ATP, it releases energy. So you should understand that. So when needed, this bond energy is utilized for biosynthetic, osmotic and mechanical activities. So the most important energy currency in living system is the bond energy in adenosine triphosphate. So the ATP molecule, you can see uh, the phosphate groups has it, which is attached to sugar and sugar to the uh, nitrogenous base. Okay. So the respiratory process and glycolysis, which is taking place in the cyclic, in the cytoplasm of the cell. See, all these are the steps which we'll be discussing again in the uh, plant physiology respiration topic. We'll be discussing about the glycolysis, how energy is utilized, how energy is uh, uh, liberated and how energy from the uh, complex the food molecule oxidation it takes place in the uh, the terminal oxidation or oxidative phosphorylation where energy rich molecules are oxidized to liberate ATP so those we will be discussing in the respiration process one NADPH2 will be liberating three ATPs one FADH2 will be liberating two ATPs so all that we'll be discussing in the topic of respiration later we'll be studying about that in detail so here the overall reaction is the respiration glycolysis which is taking place within the cytoplasm and the Krebs cycle or citric acid cycle which is taking place within within the uh, matrix of this uh, mitochondria okay that we'll be discussing later so as of now, remember, the bond energy is stored in the form of adenosine triphosphate. So it is the most important energy currency in the living system. So in the organisms, the metabolites are present in different concentrations. The blood concentration of glucose in a normal person, it is 4.2 to 6.1 micromolecules per liter. See here you should remember about uh, the different See in organisms, the metabolites are present in different concentrations. So the different units are used for measurement. So the blood concentration of glucose in a normal person, it should be 4.2 to 6.1 micromolecules per liter. So concentration of hormones is always, uh, it is parts per million, that is nanograms per ml. So that is what you should always remember. So the uh, metabolites are present in diff different concentration. So some of the metabolites are present in higher concentration. Some of them are present in lower concentration. Like if you take the concentration of glucose, it is higher when compared to the concentration of hormone. So the blood concentration of glucose okay. is nearly 4.2 to 6.1 micromolecules per liter. But uh, the concentration of hormone, which is another metabolite, is uh, nanograms per milliliter. So the metabolites are present in different concentration in organisms. Okay. Sir, what is the meaning of metabolites? 
metabolites already i have told you they are all the uh, intermediate products which are obtained during metabolic reactions we call it as metabolites so metabolites are of two types primary metabolites and secondary metabolites so the intermediate products obtained during a metabolic uh, process we call it as metabolites okay during metabolism the intermediate products that we are obtaining we call it as metabolites if they are important and they are required for our growth development and reproduction they are directly involved we call them as primary metabolites and they have similar physiological functions so we call them as primary metabolites examples are amino acids carbohydrates nucleic acids so the uh, the fatty acids or lipids they are all primary metabolites secondary metabolites they are not required for the uh, growth development and reproduction part of it so but they are produced in the plants see that they are uh, produced in a few of the cells like plants fungi and microbial organisms so the secondary metabolites are of different types so i gave you the examples of the secondary metabolites it can be essential oil it can be the drugs like abrin and resin it can be the uh, examples like uh, the uh, alkaloids terpenoids simple the triterpenes diterpenes okay or it can be the pigments like anthocyanins okay the pigment carotenoids all those we have discussed about and the medicinal drugs like curcumin which we are obtaining it from uh, the turmeric or the vincristine and vinblastine which we obtain from this periwinkle plant or canigle also we call it as so the rotate corolla the periwinkle plant vinca rosea so from that we obtain vincristin and vinblastin which is an important uh, cancer drug medicinal cancer drug is uh, vincristin and vinblastin is obtained from that plant okay so metabolites are the products which are obtained intermediate products which are obtained during a metabolic process so we call that as metabolites they are of two types primary metabolites and secondary metabolites okay so the uh, metabolites are present in different concentration like glucose is also a product of it's a metabolite okay so it is uh, but it is a primary metabolite and the glucose in a normal person it is 4.2 to 6.1 micromolecules per liter okay but another metabolite like hormones they are present in nanograms per ml so there is going to be uh, metabolites are present in different concentrations okay so hope you have understood about that the next part that we are having for discussion is uh, the living state okay so the living state is a non equilibrium steady state to be able to perform work that is what the living state is defined as it is a non equilibrium that is it's a dynamic process it's always subject to change uh, non equilibrium steady state to be able to perform work see systems at equilibrium cannot perform work as living organisms uh, work continuously they cannot reach equilibrium so there would be a digestion process and immediately the products that are obtained through digestion they are broken down and that energy is required for, uh, is utilized for our various metabolic process again there is a requirement of uh, food to be consumed by us and again a digestion has to take place again there is a respiration during which there is energy is released okay and that energy is released for our various metabolic activities so the living state itself is a non equilibrium steady state which facilitates for us to perform work the living state is a non equilibrium steady state it is non equilibrium itself is a steady state okay so uh, non equilibrium state is constant so the living state is a non equilibrium steady state to be able to perform work so the uh, systems at equilibrium cannot perform work you already know so as living work organisms work continuously they cannot reach equilibrium so living process is a constant effort to prevent 
for falling into equilibrium this is achieved by energy input obtained from metabolism so the energy obtained from metabolism is used for other processes so there is energy utilized and energy consumed as well as energy liberated so living process is a constant effort to prevent falling ourselves into equilibrium so that is why we uh, the definition is a very good thing the living state is a non equilibrium study state what is study is that non equilibrium state is study okay that is a constant non equilibrium is a steady state the living state is a non equilibrium steady state to be able to perform work so living process is a constant effort to prevent falling into equilibrium this is achieved by energy input obtained from metabolism so the uh, constant effort to prevent falling into equilibrium it requires energy where is that energy obtained from the metabolism so no living state uh, without metabolism so there is no living state without metabolism or without energy requirements so the next topic that we have is enzymes which will be discussing in the next class okay so what are enzyme types of enzyme the uh, enzyme activity how they are brought about so all that will be discussing in the next class